morning, everybody. It is a blessing to be in the house of the Lord today, isn't it? Uh, I just want to thank everyone for coming out. We have just a few announcements to make this morning, and we'll open in prayer, and then we'll get back into our time of worship. Um, I do want to ask you guys to be praying for Michelle. She's had uh, a little incident this morning with the dog, and she's got a little cut over her eye. Well, it's more of a gash over her eye, and she's not with us today, uh, so we're kind of scrambling to get the PowerPoints and things running. Does it look like we're going to have them? We're going to have them? All right, good. Yeah, all right, we are going to have them, so thank the Lord for that. Uh, but uh, please be praying for her, and also please remember all the new concerns we have in the prayer request. Uh, Christian sympathies for the family of Angel Marsh and the family of Nancy Wilson, which is Marie Marsh's sister. And also please remember all the continuing prayers that we have. I know we have many that are not listed in our church family. Please be praying for those. Be praying for our church. Be praying for our community. You know, th those are very important things we need to continually be praying for, uh, talking to the Lord about. Um, also, we are having a third Sunday tonight, our youth program. It starts at, at 6 o'clock. Am I right on that? I don't know why I'm thinking 6.30. It popped in my head as I said 6. So, yeah, 6 o'clock, um, it starts downstairs. And also, I know we mentioned the newsletter deadline last week. It has been extended a week. You have till this Tuesday. If you have anything that needs to be put in the newsletter, you have until this Tuesday to get it to Amanda, to have it in there, any announcements or anything you would like to share with the church family. And then we also have all our regularly scheduled uh, activities through the week. We have a choir rehearsal on Tuesday. We have Bible study on Wednesday night. Uh, we are in Genesis. We just finished up. You know, we're finishing up. We're getting into the flood right now. Uh, we're getting, into, uh, getting away from pre what we call prehistory into history. And so it's an interesting time. So we'd encourage you to come and be a part of that. And um, uh, we have, uh, really don't have a lot coming up right now, do we, Randy? We were talking about that Tuesday. Um, we have the homecoming coming up in, in a few more weeks. You know, it's not far off. Be, please be praying about that, uh, about that service and about everyone that will be attending that. And uh, just be praying about the upcoming holidays. You know, we've got Christmas and, of course, Halloween. You know, it's a big, big holiday. We've got Thanksgiving. We've got a lot of travel that's going to be taking place. Be, please be praying about those things as well. So at this time, we'll go before the Lord in prayer, and then we'll continue with our time of worship. Dear Lord, I thank you so much. I just thank you for everyone that has come out today. I pray, Lord, that you touch each of us. You open our hearts and our minds to the reality of who you are and what you've done for us. And Lord, I pray that you just help us to be the Christians you've created us to be. Help us to understand the importance of following your words in everything we say and we do. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I almost forgot, Randy. Uh, we are going to do our fellowship time right now. So if you would just stand and take a few minutes and welcome those around you in the pews and uh, just get to know each other a little better and then we will go into our time of worship. Take your hymnal and turn to page 210 and sing, we'll sing all the verses of My Jesus, I Love Thee, page 210.
turn over to 147 and we'll sing the first, second, and fourth verses of And Can It Be. <clears throat>
If everyone would, please open your Bibles to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 22 is where we will be starting. We'll also be reading, well, there's several, there's quite a few readings today. We'll also be reading out of Luke to start. But the title of the sermon today is The Commands of Jesus, Love. You know, it's, love is one of those things, it's kind of, I hate to say it's a tricky topic it's a tricky subject but for Christians it is sadly a tricky subject you know because a lot of times today religious people and I won't say Christians I'm gonna say religious people because it it goes across religion it's not just a Christian issue but when we speak of love and we're speaking from a religious perspective it's always a loaded topic it seems like it seems like we want to we want to put hidden meaning into things and we want to talk about it. And that's one of the reasons that I have over the last few weeks in these sermons, I give definitions. Because uh, anytime I have someone ask me about sharing the gospel or anytime I have someone ask me about, you know, uh, apologetics, you know, defending the faith, I said, you have to define terms. Because if, even if you're talking to another Christian, a lot of times words mean different things. You know, the word backslide. You know, you you hear that term, you don't hear it a lot in Baptist churches, you know, but when you do hear it, it has a totally different meaning than if you go to a Pentecostal church or a Methodist church, you know, uh, so you have to define these terms to understand exactly what we're talking about. And love is one of those things where, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult topic because everyone, love means something different to everyone. You know, and so we're going to look at love from a biblical standpoint. We're going to look at love from a Christian standpoint. We're going to look at love from the point of God today. You know, and we're going to see just how important it is to Jesus. So Matthew chapter 22, starting at verse 37, the word of the Lord says, He said to him, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much. I thank you for everyone that has come out today. And Lord, I pray that as we're here, we listen to these words of yours. We open our hearts up to them. Lord, we not only understand them academically, we not only have an understanding to be able to break it down and to conjugate verbs and different things of that nature, but we we take it in and we soak it in and we apply it to our lives and we begin to live by the words that you give us. We begin to live a life that is more pleasing to you. Just help us with this today, dear Lord. Watch over us, lead us and guide us in everything and help us, Lord, to be a light to this world and to do everything for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So you see that right there, you know, and again, this is something that we read a lot. We have been reading a lot in these last few sermons, but it it is of vital importance to hear that. It says, you know, verse 37 says, he said to him, this is talking about Jesus saying to someone, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. It's greater than following, keeping the uh, ordinances. It's greater than coming to church, which is not even a command that Jesus gives us. It's greater than looking the part. It's greater than daily Bible reading. It's greater than daily prayer. It is of utmost importance. Loving God with everything we have. And then verse 39 says, and the second is like it. He doesn't say, he says the second. He's saying this is the second command, but it's just as important as the first, to love your neighbor as yourself. You know, sometimes I think as Christians, we lose sight of loving our neighbors. We get so wrapped up in politics. We get so wrapped up in personal gain. We get so wrapped up in winning that we forget that it's not about winning, but it's about bringing the lost to the Lord. A good example of this, of this passage is over in cha- Luke chapter 10, and it kind of covers those verses that we just read again. But Luke chapter 10 at verse 25 says, Then an expert in the law stood up to test him, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he asked him. How do you read it? And he answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. 
You've answered correctly, he told him. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus took up the question and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down uh, that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan on his journey came up to him, and when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The one who showed mercy to him, he said. Then Jesus told him, go and do the same. Now this is a passage here, you know, of course, like I said, if you're a Christian, if you've been raised in church, you know, in Sunday school, in Bible school, this is a passage you've probably heard a hundred times if you've heard it once. But it's of vital importance, this passage is, and I'm not going to preach on this passage today. This is just something to show, give us an example of what we're talking about when we talk about love. You know, something I want to point out is, and I've talked about this, is there are several different kinds of love in the Greek language. You know, there, there's three main kinds that are spoken of. There's actually four, but there's three main kinds that are spoken of in the Bible. You have eros love, which is a physical love between a man and a wife. You have phileo love, which is like a love between two friends. You know, uh, Philadelphia is named after that, you know, the city of brotherly love. And then you have agape love, you know, and that's, that, that word is something that we, all Christians are familiar with now. You know, uh, we may not fully understand what it means, but uh, agape is really, it's the word that you see used in these passages in Matthew and in Luke. That is the word that keeps getting used over and over is agape love. It's not the physical love, it's not the brotherly love, but it's something special. It's what we call a godly love. Now, if we want to look at just the definition of love, you know, we can look at that, and, there, and you, know, you can use it as a noun or as a verb. And, you know, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you, when Jesus uses it, he uses it as a verb, but not as a noun. But as a noun, love is an intense feeling of deep affection or a great interest and pleasure in something. That's the noun usage of love. Now, when you look at it as a verb, it's to feel deep affection for someone or something or to like or enjoy something very much. So when we think about Jesus using agape, talking about a godly love, and then we read the definition that we use today, see, we, in the English language, we only have one word for love, so we try to encompass everything with that. So sometimes that word love that we use in English falls short of what Jesus is trying to say or what the Lord is trying to say. So we need to understand exactly what agape means. You know, that, that word agape is a godly love. It describes a love that is based on the deliberate choice of the one who loves rather than the, one, the worthiness of the one being loved. See, and that's a big disconnect in our Western idea of love. Now when we talk about love, we think of the worthiness of the person we love. You know, whether it's your wife, it's your parents, it's your children, you know, it, it's whoever it may be. When we think of love, we think of how worthy they are of our love. Of, of course, we find a way to put ourselves on top. We're of utmost importance. If I love someone, it's because they're special because my love is special. But when we talk about agape love, it's talking about making a deliberate choice to love someone and to care for someone regardless of if they deserve it or not. It's, it's this giving, it's, this, it's selfless. You expect nothing in return. That's agape love. And that kind of love goes against all human nature when you really think about it. To truly love something and expect nothing in return. And sadly, the church is not like that today. People love the church as long as the church gives them what they want. People love to go to church as long as they're happy and they're comfortable. People love to listen to a certain speaker or a certain musician as long as they say exactly what they want them to say. 
As soon as someone says something they don't like, they turn the channel. And our society has got us, has got us ready for this, you know, has got us conditioned to this today. You know, and I don't care what, what political persuasion you are, how far left or how far right you go, we all have our preferences. You know, and, and, if, and, and instead of listening to both sides and coming to a reasoned response to something, we want to hear everyone that says everything that we agree with, and they just instill in us an even greater hatred for the other people. Whether you're a CNN fan or a Fox fan, you're, you're getting ingrained in that idea of everyone has to agree with me or they're terrible or they're awful and they don't deserve my attention, my affection, or my love. But when Jesus spoke, he said, you know what? Yeah, it's easy to love people that agree with me. He says that over in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, it's easy to love people that agree with me. It's easy to love people that are like me. But true love is loving someone that does not agree with me. True love is loving someone that I know is not going to respond in the same way. I can't expect anything from them, but I still love them. That is the type of love Christians should have in their lives today. John chapter 15 at verse 12 says it like this. Of course, this is Jesus speaking again. He says, this is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Now, when we talk about this right here, you know, Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. Think about it. If you remember when Jesus gathered his apostles, he didn't go out and he didn't make them fill out resumes. He didn't make them jump through hoops to join his, his little secret society. He didn't do anything like that. He just seen these guys that were out there, these young Jewish men that had been rejected by the religious culture of the day. Now, they were still Jews, but every young Jewish boy strived to be a follower of a rabbi. You know, and the rabbis would go out and they would pick all the kids they thought would be the smartest kids and they would let them follow them around and kind of be a mentor to them. You know, they would, those kids would become disciples of that rabbi. Now, as they got a little older and the education started getting a little tougher, they would thin out that group of kids and say, okay, these three can follow me or these ten can follow me or however many it may be. And the rest of them had to go off and start working with their families and had to start raising a family, you know, doing things like normal people would do. They don't get the religious education. So his apostles were those people that at some point had been culled out of the religious education of their society. They were not uh, disciples of any rabbis. That doesn't mean that they were not valuable parts of the community, but they were not valuable enough for the rabbis to take time to deal with them. Jesus seen these men as they were out there living their lives, and he walked up to them. You know, and I'm, I'm not going to get into what Jesus knew and didn't know. I think Jesus is God. He knows everything. But he walked up to these men, seeing the lives they were living, and he said, I want you to follow me. I want to become friends with you. I don't care what you have to offer me, which was not much in comparison. I don't care what you can offer me. I don't care what you think you have to do to earn my love. I love you, and I want you to be a part of my life. That is the type of love that Jesus is talking about right there in John chapter 15. Love one another as I have loved you. Don't look at someone and think, what can they bring to me to make my love go to them? It's not about what can they give me to cause me to love them. It's I love them regardless of what happens. And, and a lot of times today in churches, we lose sight of that. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, the love chapter, I'm going to read this whole chapter, but I want us to listen to what it's saying right here and think about situations around the world today. We, we're seeing so many problems in our denominations. I'm talking about at the high levels, at the national levels. I'm not talking about in the local church. There's enough problems in the local church for everyone to have to deal with for the rest of their lives. But I want to look at even at the national level, the SBC, you know, the Methodist church and their conferences and all these different things that are happening. And you tell me where we have failed when we listen to what Paul is talking about right here in 1 Corinthians. And again, he's using that word agape. He's talking about that unconditional conditional love, that love that doesn't expect anything in return. Listen to what he says. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting at verse 1. It says, if I speak human or angelic tongues but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. 
If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith uh, so that I can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give away all my possessions and if I give over my body in order to boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, is not boastful, is not arrogant. It is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not irritable, and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish things. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Guys, Paul is speaking to a church that was in turmoil here. The church in Corinth had a lot of problems. I'm not even going to get into all the things that they had going on. But listen to what he said right there. Verses 4 and 5, 6, there he says, love is patient. It is kind. It does not envy. It is not boastful. It is not arrogant. It's not rude. And it's not self-seeking. He's speaking to the church right here. And we need to be speaking to each other and saying the same thing. If you have the love of God in your life, you should not be acting this way. You should not be arrogant. You should not think you have all the answers. You should not be out backbiting and backstabbing people. You should not be gossiping. You should not be doing all of these things that tear down the church, not individuals. When we go out and we gossip and we say mean things and we think we're being funny or witty or we think we're getting our way, in reality you're giving Satan everything he wants. And it needs to stop. And we need to stop it. When we hear someone living this way and claiming to be a Christian, you need to look at them and say, are you a Christian? You need to ask them that. Get them angry. Get them thinking about what they're doing. And if you're doing it, you need to think about what you're doing. So when we think about agape love, when we think about the type of love that Paul is talking about, that Jesus is talking about, that the entire Bible is talking about, I need to ask, why do we love that way? That's our first question I'm going to ask. Why do we love that way? What is so important about that? Why should we do that? John 13, 34 says this. It says, I give you a new command. Love one another just as I have loved you. You're also to love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now think about what he said right there. Love one another just as I have loved you. It kind of falls in line with what we read just a second ago, but he, he expounds on it a little bit. He says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. It's easy for someone to say they're a Christian. It's easy for someone to say they're a follower of God. There are people all around the world today ready to kill Christians and ready to kill Jews and ready to kill any unbeliever in the name of Allah. And they say that they're holy people. It's easy to say, guys. But Jesus right here says, everyone will know you're my disciples if you love one another, that unconditional love. So why do we love? The first blank on your notes there. We love because Jesus loves us. Think about that. We love because Jesus loves us, and love teaches the world about Jesus. All the initials after our names because of all the education we have doesn't do a thing. You know, having the oldest church in the community doesn't do a thing. Having the most prestigious church in the community doesn't do a thing. Having the largest congregation or the smallest congregation doesn't do a thing. 
people are going to know that we're disciples of the Lord because we love. We love without expecting anything in return. You know, it's sad. I, I, churches I've been in before, and I'm not blaming former pastors. I'm not blaming former members. I don't know who it was, but I, when someone would come for help and you would offer to help them, they'd say, well, you know, I'll be at church on Sunday. I'll be here. You know, and I'm like, I mean, we'd love to have you, but that's not a requirement. And they would tell me, to, I mean, and this happened more than once. They would tell me, well, someone before told me if, if I got help, I had to be at church the next Sunday. And is that love? When you look at someone and say, I'll help you with your electric bill, but you've got to come to the next four Sundays or you won't get any more help. That's not love, guys. That's expectation. That's not building relationships. That, that's building uh, uh, an army of people that depend on you for help. And you're going to say, oh, look at how our church is growing, but no one is changing because they're coming for help. They're not coming to hear the word of God. They're not coming for the help they truly need. They're coming for the physical help that you're hanging over their head like a carrot on a stick. We should love these people because Jesus loved us enough to say, I want you. Regardless of the life you live, regardless of, of your past, regardless of what your priorities are, Jesus says, I love you enough to save your soul. And we need to do the same thing. We need to look at him and say, Jesus loves you enough to save your soul, and I want to see that happen. So who do we love? That's why we love. Who do we love? Again, that passage we just read, 37 and uh, uh, 38, says he said to him, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind, and then love your neighbor as yourself. So the first thing we should truly have a love for is God. Think about that. This is your second blank there. The first thing we should have a love for is God. And then we should love our neighbors. And of course, we just read a description of who our neighbors are there in Luke chapter 10. So neighbors are not just people that live next door to us. They're not just your pew mate there in church on Sunday. They're not just people that we're comfortable being around. Our neighbors are people that are in need. I love the story that Jesus used that we read right there in Luke chapter 10. And, you know, and people love to point out the fact, especially when preachers start to talk about it, well, it was a priest that passed by on the other side. And you're right. It was a priest that passed by on the other side. It was one of those holier than thou's that thought they were above the people. You know, and sadly, a lot of Christians today take the idea of a priesthood of believers to an extreme and they think they're above the unwashed masses that we call the world. They think it's not, it's beneath them to go out and help those that are in need, to go out and show love to those that are in need because they may be a little dirty. They may be dealing with addictions that we're uncomfortable with. They may live in a lifestyle that we don't approve of. I, I feel like I say this every Sunday anymore, or not every Sunday, every week anymore, to someone. Because I'm getting this question more and more out in the community. But I'll be honest with you, I would love to have this church full of prostitutes and drug addicts and homosexuals this morning. I love if every pew in the church was full of those people and trust me we could easily fill this church up with those people from this community i would love to see this church full of those people because they need to hear the word of god we don't need to be looking at them saying hey get off the drugs stop the prostitution and get out of that homosexual relationship but then you can come to church that is not what jesus taught jesus said i love you just the way you are come and hear the truth and then let the truth set you free from the life that you're living that's what we need to get into, guys. That's what we as a church need to realize is the importance of love. The importance of this agape love. This, the importance of this uh, uh, love, this unassuming love that does not expect anything in return. Jesus said it is the most important command. And this is the seventh or eighth one that I've read about. And there's, there's about 40 or 50 that Jesus actually gives. But he said, this is the most important. We should love God and we should love our neighbors. And then here comes the big question, the last part of this. How do we do it? 
It's easy to say, just go out and love. Just go out and show affection. Just go out and give them a meal. Just go out and do this. Just go out and do that. It's always predicated on action. It's always predicated on what we do for someone. But in reality, doing things doesn't really show love. It's part of it. But when we do something, even though we may not expect anything in return from that person, we still like to feel good about it. So, you know, I was joking a few weeks ago about a selfless act. Is there a true selfless act? I don't want to get into that philosophical debate. But when we do something for someone, yes, it is out of love. But if that's all love is, then love really doesn't mean anything. John 14, 15, again, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Those are the words of Jesus. If you love me, you will keep my commands. Now here, in another passage I'm getting ready to read, John chapter 21, this is Peter and, and Jesus going back and forth. And here, out of the passages that I've used this morning, this is the only passage where agape is not the only love that's spoken of. We talk about phileo love here also. When Jesus speaks, it's agape love. When Peter speaks, it's phileo. He's using the word phileo, brotherly love. So listen to that. With that in mind, listen to this passage. John chapter 21, verse 15. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told him. A second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told him. He asked him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he had asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. When we, when we think about that, though, Jesus was sitting there saying, Peter, do you love me unconditionally? Do you expect nothing in return from me? And Peter could not bring himself to say that. Peter just kept saying, yes, Lord, you know I love you like a brother. I would do anything for you. I would give you the shirt off my back. I would do whatever it took. I would defend you to the death. And Peter kind of proved that a few times. And finally, Jesus, I don't want to say giving up, but Jesus realizing Peter cannot bring himself to that idea of the perfect love. He finally just said, feed my sheep. Love me the best you can and feed my sheep. But you notice the whole point of that passage, though, is, and it's the last blank in our notes this morning, is we love God by following his commands. That's the, of utmost importance. We, follow, we love God by following his commands. And we love others by helping those in need and not only helping them, but telling them what God has done for you. See, that's the big part that a lot of Christians leave out today. You know, we'll go help with disaster relief with the, with the Kentucky, or North Carolina Baptist men or, you know, with the Southern Baptist Convention, with these uh, non-denominational groups. And they're, they're all wonderful. They're all great in the work that they do. But if we just go clean someone's house after a flood or if we just go, you know, some people are going to Hawaii to help with the fires over there. Or maybe we'll have a hurricane over on the coast. You know, we go to help with these situations. And yes, we're showing the love of God in our actions, but if we never mention the love of God, have we really truly shown the love of God? Because so many times, and I've noticed this, it's becoming more and more common. When you go to help someone and they start talking and you say, well, I go to such and such church. You know, no matter what church you go to, what denomination, or you might say, I'm a Christian or I'm a pastor. And they'll say, oh, I'm going to be in church this Sunday. Like, like that's what you want to hear. I don't want to hear I'm going to be in church on Sunday. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love it. But being in church on Sunday is the least of my worries. Giving your heart to Jesus is what matters. Sitting in church every Sunday is not going to do anything but get you a little more comfortable on your way to hell. I'm just going to be honest with you. It's going to get you a little more comfortable as you're heading to hell because you're going to think you're okay. You're going to feel good about yourself because you pay into the tithes. You show up every Sunday. You come to occasionally to an event that the church has, and you feel good about that. That's not what God wants. God does not want your pity. God does not need your pity. God wants your love. 
God wants your unconditional acceptance of him as the Lord and Savior in your life. And he wants you to live that way. He wants you to go out and see the lost, the dying, the unwashed masses, and he wants you to share his love with them. And that is when the worldwide church, the universal church, is going to see a revival like we've never seen before. When we stop worrying about tradition, when we stop worrying about elders, when we stop worrying about youth, when we stop worrying about the church and start worrying about the lost and the dying. That's when change is going to happen and that's when the flood, uh, the, the dam will burst and the flood will, will wash out and get, away, get rid of all of the terrible things that Satan has brought into this world. But we have to love. Love is of the utmost importance, not appearance, not membership, not who's right and who's wrong, not who has the most money, not any of those things that we seem to deem so important as churches, as denominations. I'm going to be honest with you. Things that have been going on in the Southern Baptist Convention over the last few years sickened me. I'm almost ashamed to say I'm, I'm a part of the Southern Baptist Convention because of the cover-up that I feel like has taken place because of a lack of love of all those that are high up in the, in the convention. It's a good old boy network. It, it, it's everybody trying to cover up for everybody. It's let's hide this and sweep it under the rug. We made fun of the Catholic Church and all the things they went through for years and years and now we're facing the same thing. And instead of having the love of God in our lives and owning up to it and saying, hey, let's make it right. Let's show that true love. We're trying to hide it. That is not something to be proud of. We need to get back to what God has taught us in his word about what the church is and what the church should be. And we need to focus on that. So as Randy gets ready with a song, I'm going to ask you one more question. Are you ready to get back to that? Are you ready to start showing the world the love of God? Are you ready to start calling out people that claim to be Christians that are not acting like Christians? It's not just your job. It's not just the pastor's job. It's everybody's job. We need to defend the faith that we say we believe so strongly in. We need to defend the church that we uphold so highly. Instead of trying to please everyone and keep everyone happy. You now the Lord tells us in several places, he did not come, but I'm paraphrasing, don't quote this. He didn't come to keep people happy. He come to divide. He come to cut the world away from the believers. He come to make life bearable for those that wanted to follow him. And for some reason in church, we allow those that make everything miserable, continue to make everything miserable. We got to stop. We got to say enough. Are we willing to do that today? Guys, if you love this church, I'm not talking about just First Baptist, but if you love First Baptist Church, if you love Southern Baptist Convention, if you love serving God, then make today the day you take a stand. I'm not asking you to come forward. I'd love it if you, if you would. If you come forward, I'll pray with you. I'll come down here and we'll pray together for God to embolden us to help us become what he wants us to be. But I'm asking you to pray. I'm asking you to say, Lord, today is the day I want to take a stand. Today is the day I'm ready to stop letting everyone else decide how I serve you and how I worship you. And you know what, guys? You'd be amazed at what God calls you to do when you start listening to him instead of all those voices in your ear. 
You'd be amazed at what can happen when we start listening to God instead of everybody saying, this is how it's supposed to be. Then we go to our Bibles and see that's nothing how it's supposed to be. Let's start showing the love that we say we have in everything we say and we do. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much. I just thank you for each and every one that has come out today. And Lord, I pray that you just help us. Help us to learn how to love again, Lord. Help us to love in a way that you see fit, in a way that you have deemed necessary. That agape love, that selfless love. Help us with this, Lord. Help us to show people this love. Not just talk about it. And help us to understand it a little better ourselves. Just watch over us today, Lord, as we go out of this building. Help us to be a light to this community and to show people how wonderful it is to live for you each and every day. I love you, Lord, so much, and I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank everyone for being here. We've got one more song we're going to sing. Uh, I ask you to sing that with us, and then you are dismissed to go out and be a light to the world. Thanks, everybody, for coming.